Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending the community service this year at New Colony Baptist Church. We are honored with a special guest speaker, Pastor Mitchell Minson from uh, First Baptist in Linden. He's going to expound upon the word for us tonight. That was my son. <laughs> if you're really good, they'll do the wave later. If you're really good. Uh, it, it is a joyous time for churches to come together. It's a special time of the year where we're able to give thanks for all the blessings of God. And I want to share with you guys just a short, short testimony. I have a brother that lives in Louisiana. And he, he texts me this week and he says, hey, can you guys have service in person in Texas? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, can we come visit? <laughs> so... We think about things differently in America. We really do. And when, when we think about church service, for us, it's a normal, natural, everyday thing. Not every state operates the way Texas operates. Amen? Amen. So we are blessed in the reference to the fact he asked. He's like, do you guys have Sunday morning service? Yes. Do you have Sunday night service? Yes. Do you have Wednesday night service? Yes. He says, are you doing anything else during the week? I said, well, on Thursdays we do Bible study. He says, well, that's great. I said, well, you're welcome to come visit. In light of that, I just wanted to share with you guys, here we are in the middle of nowhere, East Texas, coming together as at least three churches are here tonight, and we're going to be sharing the message and the word of God, and we are going to be in the presence of our Lord and Savior, so it's a blessed time, so thank you guys very much for coming. I'm going to say a short prayer, and then I'm going to turn the music over to Miss Krista, and she's going to lead us in a wonderful experience. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for blessing us with an opportunity to come together. Thank you, dear Lord, for opening the doors of your house, dear Lord. Thank you, dear Lord, for your precious son, Jesus. I pray tonight that as we lift our voices in song, that you would allow us to experience you, dear God. And as Brother Mitchell comes and leads us in your, your word, dear God, that we open our Bibles, we read through these words, dear God, and they settle in on our hearts, and the Holy Spirit will deliver them to us so that the devil never has the ability to snatch them away. Just lead us and guide us and direct us to be the men and women of God that this lost and dying world needs. Amen. Amen. Ms. Christie? All right. I'm excited about this. Um, when I was told about this service, at first I had no clue because I was just told, hey, you're going to be hearing from these people about this. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, but then I asked Brother Todd what it was about, and I got excited that we were all coming together to worship God together. So, I invite you to stand as we start with number 585, Count Your Blessings. I'm sure everybody knows this song.
tried really hard to get this song memorized, but it did not happen. So if you see me glancing at my phone, it's because I forgot the lyrics. <laughs> but um, this song is titled, In Everything Give Thanks. So myself and Brother John Baxter from Bear Creek 
are officially on the bank account for the ministerial alliance. So if you know someone who is in need and uh, your individual church doesn't have the ability to help them, the ministerial alliance operates to, to fill in that gap. So in just a moment, we're going to be passing the offering plate. And this is how we fund the ministerial alliance. We don't have it as a budget line in any one church. So whatever you guys give is what we divide up throughout the year, and we try and help those individuals. I can assure you that since I've taken it over, uh, Brother Brian, he says, he says, Claude, he says, this is how I used to do it. He says, but you feel free to do it however you want to. I always make sure that when they come in for help, they get the gospel. They know who Jesus Christ is, and they know that that's the love of God that is helping them. If someone ever comes back to me after I've helped them the first time, um, there are stipulations before we can help them again. And I know that that's not the most Christian perspective. It's not, but it's kind of a hedge of protection. So you don't have to be a member of one of our churches, but you have to tell me what church you've been attending for the second time you come to us for help. And I will call your pastor and I will ask if you attend regularly. And if you do, then we will do everything we can to help you. But if you do not attend church regularly, me giving you money or groceries or helping with your gas bill is not going to help you because your eternal soul is at stake. So I just wanted to share with you guys, uh, Brother Brian was going to be here tonight, but I don't see him anywhere. So I did want to let you know we made a special certificate for Brother Brian for a lifetime of dedication and service, not only to Pinecrest Baptist Church, but to our community and to the ministerial alliance. He has been serving in this community for 27 years uh, and has been there uh, as a stable pastor for Pinecrest Baptist Church. I personally think of him as a, uh, a good, godly encourager. And any time I ever needed help, I could always rely on Brother Brian. So I will be seeing him over the next couple of days to give him a certificate. If you are a member of, of Pinecrest Baptist Church, I want you to know you are blessed to have a godly man lead your church for as long as he has been there. And, and we enjoy having him in our community as well. So I don't get to hear him preach, uh, but I still love the man. So we're going to have a short prayer, and then I'm going to ask for the pastors to come forward to help me pass this plate around. Mitch, you don't worry about it. You've been standing up long enough. So, uh, Brother Virgil, would you come forward? And come on, brother. Uh, we need one more person. Who else wants to volunteer? There we go. Kelly, thank you, brother. I lost you in the background back there. Young man, you tell the good one, <laughs> Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for blessing us with an opportunity to be the church to the lost. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us a chance to reach out and minister to those people who will not necessarily show up for a Sunday morning service. But when you have them in their moment of need, they know that they can find a godly man. They know that they can find a Christian. They know that they can find help and support in the house of God. Just please continue to allow us to service in this, this community, in this ministry, as long, dear God, as it brings great glory to you. Amen. Amen.
this time, I'm going to turn the services over to Brother Mitchell Minson. Her Mitchell or Mitch? Okay. I'm going to turn the services over to Brother Mitch. Uh, I am told that uh, if any of his deacons fall asleep, that you're allowed to elbow them. I'm just saying. <laughs> Can y'all hear me? Yes, I hear one. Which way? That way? Good. Oh, he was again a minute ago. How about this way? <coughs> Give it a moment. There we go. All right. Um, I, I want to take a moment to introduce my daughter and my son to you. Uh, this is Taylor. He's my oldest son. This is Karis. She's my youngest daughter. She's a sophomore at uh, Lyndon Kildare High School. And um, we, Taylor and I, I don't think you were with us, Karis. Taylor and I went to a music conference in Southern California a few years ago. And Corey Voss was there leading worship. And I had never heard of Corey Voss. I didn't know who Corey Voss was. And he wrote this song and he performed it that day and I was just blown away when I heard it. It really touched my heart. And um, came back and we didn't have time to try and teach it or learn it. So I literally played his CD the next day in service to share it with people uh, because I thought it was such a great blessing. And so I hope that you're blessed by it tonight.
Brother Claude, we could just go home after that, amen? <laughs> thank you, Karis. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, choir. Let's give them a hand, amen? <laughs> Ms. Christy, you did a great job with them. Thank you. Um, it is my great honor to be with you tonight. Some of you have met me before tonight. Some of you have not. But my name is Mitch Minson. I am the new pastor. I guess I'll be that for the next, I don't know, 15 years or so. <laughs> um, I'll be the new pastor um, at First Baptist here in town. And um, God has used us um, in many different ways throughout our marriage, my marriage to my wife. My wife, Deanna, is back there. Give them the, the pageant wave. She is the love of my life. She's my prime rib, my number one A1. Uh, I love her to death. And so... We're so glad that she's here, and then um, my two other sons are here with us. Uh, you met Taylor already. We have Luke, and we have Stephen, um, and they were in the choir. S Luke is also a sophomore at um, Lyndon Kildare. Yes, they are twins, um, and, st and Stephen is not. <laughs> um, Stephen is a college student, going to be starting at, uh, in Texarkana this spring. We got here too late for them to start in the fall, and so i um, grateful to have them my wife is a resource teacher or interventionist, I think they call them now, at Lyndon Kildare Elementary School. We moved here from Bakersfield, California. <laughs> Can I tell you, California is a great place to be from. <laughs> um, we're actually not from California, we're from Louisiana, but God allowed us to serve him there for about eight years um, in Bakersfield, California. When God calls you to do something, you say yes. Even when you don't understand it, you just say yes, because one of the things I have learned in 20 years of pastoring, his ways are better than my ways. His thoughts are better than my thoughts. He comes up with much better plans than what I do, and he did that for tonight. I was telling Brother Claude um, several weeks ago when we met, he asked me if I would be willing to be the sacrificial lamb, I mean preacher tonight, <laughs> um, since this was my, my first time here um, for this service, I got kind of thrown to the wolves. And so I told him, sure, and I thought to myself, the worst thing that could happen is they don't ask me again. <laughs> and so that's okay. Uh, no, I'm, I'm honored to be here and honored to preach the Word of God. When I began preparing for tonight, I felt like God was leading me to a certain passage of Scripture. You may want to go ahead and turn there to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. And I wrote a whole message twice. And this afternoon, God said, well, I'm glad you wrote your message, now I want you to hear mine. And so tonight you're going to hear parts of mine, but I hope you hear all of his uh, tonight because his ways are better than our ways. So Colossians chapter 1, when you get to that passage of scripture, it's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, in case you're not sure where to find that one. Colossians chapter 1, my people know that we do this at First Baptist. Would, as we read from God's word, would you stand with me in honor of his word this evening? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who are at Colossus. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a liberty here for a moment and say who are in Cass County. Okay, now, this wasn't written to us, but it is written for us. Okay, so I want you to understand that. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope preserved for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our fellow our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, now anytime you see the word for in Scripture, you need to ask, what is it there for? And so he sets the stage. He talks about all of the things he's heard about them. And now he, he shifts gears. He says, for this reason, since the day we heard about it, we have not ceased praying for you. And asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, 
so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for attaining of all, all, of all perseverance and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified, I want you to hear that word, he has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. How? Again, look at your next word, for. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you for your word. Tonight, Father, I ask that you take this humble effort and that, Lord, you allow me to decrease and you to increase. Tonight, Lord, as we think of all the reasons we have to be thankful, may you top each of our lists. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Brother Claude did a fantastic job explaining the role of the Ministerial Alliance, and, and he really made a good point. If we help people in the Ministerial Alliance and make their journey through life easier, but we don't point them to the love of Jesus, all we've done is make their journey to hell more comfortable. And so there's much more to it than just simply helping people. There has to be a heart that leads us in the paths of righteousness that God would have us to, lead, to go down. Now, we have many things to be thankful for, people. We have to be thankful for our nation. Do you realize how blessed you are to live in the United States of America? Do you realize that you are one of the few people on the face of the earth that have the freedom to do what you're doing right now? We have brothers and sisters around the world who, if they assembled in a manner like we're assembling tonight, and it was found out, they would be killed. Their families would be killed. Their businesses would be destroyed. Every aspect of their life would be erased from their community. But in the United States, we have been blessed. We have been given the opportunity to come together and boldly and faithfully proclaim the truth of the Word of God. We should be thankful for that. We should not take it for granted. We should be thankful for our state. I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm thankful that I live in Texas. <laughs> Coming from California, that's an easy step. But, you know, I'm from Louisiana. And Texas has got their slogan, don't mess with Texas, right? And I always said it was because you didn't want to get it on your hands. And then God called us here. And now it's all over me. And I'm thankful for being in Texas. I'm thankful for being in a place where men and women and, can go and, and proclaim the gospel. I'm thankful for being in a place where my children go to school and they pray in Jesus' name. I'm thankful for being in a place where on the sign outside of our elementary school, Romans 8, 28 is clearly posted. I'm thankful that we live in a community that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for our churches. Listen, Jude uh, verse 3 says that we should contend for the faith. We should contend for our churches. We should fight. We should be ready to battle for our churches. Our people matter. God has gathered together a group of people here in Linden and in Cass County. He has placed within us everything we need to reach the lost people in this community. Do you believe that? Amen. I don't believe you. Do you believe that? He's given us everything that we need. He's given us the truth of his word. He's given us faithful pastors. Brother Claude, I'm so grateful that God's placed you here. The witness of Brother Brian through our community, that's incredible. Brother Kelly, where, there you snuck back there in the back on me. You, you could be a back row Baptist if you aren't careful. <laughs> You're going to get converted here tonight. There's hope after all. It, it, I'm glad that God put men here who would be willing to share the gospel. We should be thankful for our churches. We should be thankful for our families. Listen, I introduced you to my family. I am blessed. I am so blessed. I love you too, Luke. Um, I have had the honor of baptizing all five of my children. My oldest daughter, who lives in San Diego, and my youngest daughter have both surrendered their lives to missions. 
My son, my oldest son, has led our worship in our previous church for three years, four years. We should be thankful for our families. Even when they give us hard times, we should be thankful for them. We should be thankful for our jobs. Now, some of you have retired. You should be thankful for retirement. Because you, didn't have, you wouldn't have time to work if you had to take a job right now, would you? You know, one of the other things I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for being qualified. And I don't mean to be a pastor, although I've been to school and I've been to seminary and I, I've been licensed and I've been ordained and I've been beat up and beat down. And I'm qualified because of what God has done. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with an education. It has nothing to do with a position. It has to do with the grace of God that poured out upon me. And this morning, this evening, I'm going to say this morning a lot because right now we're not having evening services and so I'm caught up in that. This evening, I want to talk to you tonight about that concept of being qualified. Now you get in the mail sometimes qualification letters. How many of y'all have gotten about 12 qualification letters for credit cards recently? You're pre-approved. All you have to do is sign this piece of paper. We'll send you a card in the mail. You can spend all the money you want for 29.99% interest. You're qualified. Some of us are overqualified, if you know what I mean. We live our lives continually paying on all those credit cards that we've qualified for. Tonight, I want to focus on that word qualified we see here in this text. Because Paul, as he's writing to the church, he's talking to them about all these wonderful things that he's giving thanks for them because of their faith and their hope and their love. And by the way, that, that famous love chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, finishes that there are three things remain, faith, hope, and love, the very three things that he commends the Colossus church for here. He's so grateful for them and for their willingness to follow after God. And then he gets to the real meat of the matter. And he says there in verse 12 that he gives thanks to the Father who has qualified us, listen to this, to share in the inheritance of the saints. Now, I want you to imagine with me for just a moment that we could somehow transport ourselves temporarily to the throne room of God. And I want you to think about the riches and the, ma the majestic nature of that. I want you to think about how heaven has the gates of pearls and streets of gold. I want you to think about the foundations of precious stones and the tree of life and, and the river of life. I want you to think about how Jesus himself is there and there is no need for a son. Or a, I want you to think about how glorious and magnificent and tremendous and amazing heaven is. And then I want you to realize he's qualified people to be an inheritance or to have an inheritance of that. But not just any people. Not just anyone. There are some who teach that everybody goes to heaven. By the way, Jesus wasn't one of those. There are some who teach that you can make your own way to heaven. Jesus wasn't one of those either. And neither, according to this passage, was Paul. Because Paul points out in verse 13 what really happens when we get qualified. And it's my prayer tonight that each of you and each of us in our community become qualified by Paul's definition. So what does he say in verse 13? He says, first, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness. Now, one of the things that just breaks my heart, Brother Claude, Brother Kelly, is so many people in the church today for, have forgotten what it means to be lost. We've lost sight in our own minds of what it means to not have hope to be out there in the world struggling and trying to figure out how we're going to make it to the next day and not knowing any hope at all. We are so comfortable in our padded pews and air conditioned and ceiling fans and nice sound system. Man, it's a beautiful building. Wonderful building. We're so comfortable in our Christianity that we've lost sight of what it meant to not know Christ. 
So when I looked into the scriptures at this word, where he rescued us from the domain of darkness, the word rescued there in the Greek is like the idea of someone falling down in the middle of Highway 59 out here, and and an 18-wheeler truck is coming down the road, and it's barreling towards them at 75 miles an hour. And they can't do anything. They're, They're stuck there in the middle of the road, and someone comes and literally drags them out of the danger. The word, the Greek word, means to be dragged along the ground and removed from danger. That's what God has offered to all men. That no matter where you are in life, no matter what you faced in life, no matter what the circumstances of life that you have been in in this moment, God has come and he has offered to drag you out of the danger And what is the danger that he talks about? He talks about the danger of the domain of darkness. That's a realm, that's that's this concept of, of a power that exists out there that's destroying people. Listen, if you don't believe that there's a power in our world that's destroying people, listen, open your eyes. The Bible says that we have an enemy who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. As you look at the lives of our teenagers on our campuses, as my children are making friends and visiting with people. My heart breaks as I watch family after family in our community fall apart. My heart breaks as I hear about kids who are are doing things that are destructive to their bodies and are going to ruin their future. My heart breaks when I see people that are, are looking to everything but Jesus for hope. They're completely and totally oppressed by the darkness around them, and they're trying so hard to see, and there's nothing there. And the Bible says that Jesus came to rescue them, to drag them out, to pull them from the domain of darkness, to remove them from where they are. Brother Claude, this is a beautiful building. I told you that. I don't want to make you nervous. I don't want to make your people nervous. How many here from New Colony? Okay, y'all forgive me for this. You love Jesus? If you love Jesus, you have to love me even after this, okay? (laughs) It's in the Bible. I think we need to break some things tonight. Now you're really getting nervous. And my deacons are sitting back there thinking, are they going to send us a bill? (laughs) We need to break some things tonight. One of the things we need to break is we need to break this idea that sets hold in our churches of this good old boy salvation. This idea that people can just be good. And they can do enough. They can, you know, there, there's people that, out there that, man, listen, they're good people. You need something, they'll help you. You have a problem, they'll walk with you through it. You've got a, an issue, they're there. But that doesn't mean that they've been rescued from the darkness. It just means that they're good people. And I want you to understand something. Of all the things that we have to be thankful for, we should be thankful that it's not about being a good person. I've always wondered, Brother Darren, if if God was calling us to to be saved by our goodness, what if we missed one thing? What if there was that just just one time we'd help that little lady push her shopping cart? What if one time that we had not told the little white lie? Which, I don't know why we throw white on there. Lie is a lie, right? What if we had just been a little bit better than we were? What if when we measured that cosmic scale... We had done just one more thing that would have tipped the scales in our favor, and then we would have been okay. Could you imagine living your life with the idea that if I could just do enough, and listen, there are people out there that that's where they're living. Church, we should be so grateful. We should be so grateful that we have a God who's qualified us, who's rescued us from the domain of darkness, and we don't have to worry about being a good old boy to get to heaven. Secondly, I think we need to break the concept of church membership salvation. I wish I'd have brought a membership role from our church, Brother Rodney, so we could set that sucker on fire in here tonight. You know why? Because if you're counting on your name being on that list, getting you onto the list that gets you into heaven, you fail. Jesus isn't interested in how many churches you join. Jesus is interested in whether you surrendered to his love and his grace. Have you been rescued from the domain of darkness? 
Jesus is interested in whether or not you've had a genuine conversion experience with Jesus Christ, where there was a time in your life that you knew, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Because if that's not there, then you're not qualified for the inheritance of the saints. If you haven't been rescued from the domain of darkness, if you tried to do it by being a good church member. Now, Brother Kelly, we love good church members, right? You know the ones I'm talking about. They come in, they, they, they help us, they do whatever. We had a pastor, or when I was pastoring in, in Bakersfield, I had a church member there who was our director of missions from our association. And he told me right after we met, he said, I'm one of your best church members. I send my tithe every month and I'm never there to cause a problem. <laughs> Pastors, wouldn't you take a few of those? No. Because it's not about all that. You can give money to the church all day long. You can be the best church member that anyone has ever seen and you can spend eternity separated from God in hell. Because it is not about being a good church member. It's about being rescued from the domain of darkness. It's about being rescued from the reality of your sin and being changed. Thirdly, let's break the concept of transactional salvation. This idea that one time when I was seven, I walked down an aisle and I prayed this silly little prayer at one moment, and I've lived the rest of my life however I wanted to live it, but I'm going to heaven. It's not in scriptures. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And we take that verse, but we don't think about what it means. Because when Paul wrote that, he said, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that word means something. That is not Jesus' first name, by the way. Lord is a title. And it means the one who's in control. He's the boss. And it's his way or it's no way. You follow him or you don't. You can't say, I want a little bit of Jesus on this side. I need some fire insurance so I don't end up burning for eternity. I'm thankful that he's rescued us from the domain of darkness. But that's not all. He says, he's rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. He's changed, he's tra transformed us. The Greek word there means to change the place in which you stand. And so as an example this, this evening, before I knew Jesus Christ, before I was rescued from the domain of darkness, before I followed in faith the, the call of Jesus and received the gift of salvation, I, I was standing in the midst of my own efforts. And, and I wasn't a terrible person, but in my heart there were problems that existed that I couldn't solve, and, and I knew nothing about God. But then God changed me. He transferred me. He brought me from that place to a whole new place, and no longer am I there. I am now here, and I can't go back there because He has moved me. He's changed me. He's transformed me. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And you might say, well, I'm a child of God. I've been rescued from the darkness. I've been set free from that. And I've lived my life the way I want to live my life because that's just me. And I will say to you, you are in deception. Because those who have been changed by God have been changed. Now, let me tell you, when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, not everything changes at once. But if you're not in the process of becoming more like Jesus every day, then you're in the process of becoming less like Jesus every day. In fact, James says it this way. Friendship with the world is hostility towards God. If you want to follow after all the things that were over here where you used to be, that is looking at God and saying, yes, I know you died on the cross. Yes, I know you paid the penalty for all of my sins. Yes, I've claimed that I've accepted your gift of salvation. Yes, I've repented of those sins. Yes, I've called you Lord. But in this area of my life, you can't have it. And I'm going to live like I want to. But God. 
rescues us from the domain of darkness. He transfers us. He transfers us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption. We have hope. We have peace. We have meaning. We have life. We have joy. We have the very presence of God indwelling us. He is sealing us for the day of redemption. And in him, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Now, I'm thankful for, (coughs) excuse me, I'm used to my my being up here. (laughs) I'm thankful for our country, thankful for our state, thankful for our community. I'm thankful for our churches. I'm thankful for my family. But most of all, I'm thankful that God chose to qualify me, to redeem me, to change me. So I don't have to be this guy anymore. This guy was, was hurting. This guy didn't have any hope. This guy over here was living his life for himself, for pleasure, for the moment. Now, I have purpose, I have meaning. When I wake up in the morning, I don't have to wonder what's going to happen to me. I rest in the full assurance that I now have an inheritance among the saints. How about you? Are you sure of that? I know some of you are saying, Pastor Mitch, I've been here in this church for 49 years. I've been going to church longer than you've been alive. That's not what I asked you. Some of you may sit there and say, I, I'm a pretty good guy. I've got my faults, but for the most part, I've done the right thing. It's not what I asked you. Have you been rescued from the domain of darkness? Some of you said a prayer in a Sunday school class or in a vacation Bible school or at an altar, and that was the extent of how you followed Jesus. I'm not asking you about that. I'm asking you, have you been rescued from the domain of darkness? Has he transferred you from darkness into light? Would you just close your eyes for a moment? The pianist is going to come. Of all the things to be thankful for at Christmas, there's not at, the, at Thanksgiving and at Christmas, <laughs> of all the things to be thankful for today, there is nothing more worthy of our thanks than the hope that's available in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're a senior adult here and you're you're realizing tonight how much you need to have hope in Christ. How you have played the church game but you've never surrendered your life. Would you do that tonight? Teenagers, maybe you come to church because you've got that drug problem your parents drag you every time. Do you know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord? Do you have a true relationship with him? I'm not asking you, do you, do you know all the answers? I'm asking you, do you know him? And if you don't, tonight would be a fantastic night if that could be true of you. Father, in a group like this, Lord, we know so many are active and faithful in their churches. And yet, Lord, we don't want to assume anything at all. And so in this moment, Father, I pray that if there be one here that needs to make a decision to trust you, that tonight you give them the faith to step out of the pew that they're sitting in, and to choose to be rescued tonight. To allow you control of their life. 
Would you do that tonight, Father? In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, the pianist is going to play, and we're going to have what in the Baptist tradition we call an invitation. We're going to invite you to make a decision to trust God tonight. Maybe it's for salvation. Maybe there's another need you have in your life that you need someone to pray for you. But I'm going to ask Brother Kelly and Brother Claude and the other pastors that are present, would you come forward here at the altar tonight? And if God is calling someone, would you please respond? Your pastor will be here. We'd love to pray for you tonight. Would you stand? speaking to you? Do you hear his voice in your heart? Is he calling you to obedience? Is he asking you? Would you answer him? This isn't about embarrassing anyone. This is about your opportunity to act in faith, to say, Lord, I know that I'm in trouble without you, but tonight I choose to follow. Is there anyone at all? Maybe tonight as you're here, you would say, Pastor Mitch and Pastor Kelly, Pastor Claude, I know that I have kind of taken for granted some of the things that God's blessed me with. But tonight I choose to go back to that moment where he saved me. And tonight I just want to say, Lord, thank you. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? If you just want to thank God for saving your soul, would you slip your hand up? Amen. All around the room. Thank you. Thank you. Do you realize what that means? That you've been rescued. You've been transferred. There's hope in Jesus because of that, eternity is secure. And we're so grateful for that. Father, tonight, as we continue in this service by remembering the gift of your Son, Lord, I pray that you help us to have pure hearts and open hearts as we're receiving the gift of this remembrance. That tonight, Lord, you would be honored in this place. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Tonight, as we take a moment to remember the gift of Jesus, as we're thankful for having been rescued from the domain of darkness, I want you to realize and remember that there was a price that went along with that rescue. Jesus didn't just step into the road and drag you from the domain of darkness. He climbed on the cross and he paid the ultimate price. He gave himself. He took upon himself the sins of all of us and all mankind so that we might have life. It says in Matthew chapter 26, on the night <clears throat> before he was arrested, he gathered with his disciples in an upper room. He says, now while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take eat. This is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is being poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. As we receive this bit of juice and this wafer, 
It represents the sacrifice of our Savior. It represents how far he had to go to rescue us and to transfer us the price that he was willing to pay. I'm going to ask Brother Kelly, would you bless our observance today? Gracious Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts and bread and wine. And make it be for us the blood of Christ poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. There's no saving power in eating this. The saving power is on the cross, what Jesus has done. He gave his life, he broke himself. 
Yes, he was condemned at the cross by others, but Jesus gave himself for us. This is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. The scriptures teach us that throughout the Old Testament, sacrifices were made and people brought animals and they were killed and the blood poured upon the altar. Each one of those sacrifices pointed to the reality that they were ultimately powerless to forgive sin. Only God in His grace. And that, so they were pleas. They were, they were petitions brought before God. Lord, would you deliver us? And then He did. He sent Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, without spot or blemish, who gave Himself for us. The Bible says that apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But because Jesus gave his blood, because he paid the price, the power of life is in the blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. I'm so very grateful for the opportunity to share this moment with each of you. Brother Claude, I'm not sure what's next on the just dismissal. Actually, there's a verse for us to sing first. I was going to say, the scripture says they departed with a song. Okay, so let's be, let's be scriptural. And after the moment had passed when Jesus shared the bread and the wine, they departed with a song. So would you stand to your feet and let's sing with you. Thank you for joining us this evening. You are dismissed.